Mr. President, unfortunately, the Caribbean today also finds itself at the front line of too many other major challenges. That's why I ask all the time who sees us and who hears us. We continue to be confronted by problems of blacklisting, which pale into insignificance when compared to climate change, but which destroy our financial sector. The illicit flow of weapons, such that the ease with which people can go into public spaces and shoot and kill others is now regarded as just another item on the news because we promote profit in the manufacture and trade of guns and weapons, of non-communicable diseases that strike down our people in the most insidious of ways because we allow diets that promote the prosperity of a few multinational corporations to become the norm of the day with the food that we eat and the lives that we live. And in the case within our own community, Belize and Guyana continue to face challenges to their territorial integrity. I suppose people feel that because we have talked so long about Belize and Guyana and Cuba, that we can continue to talk about climate change and these other things, and that it is okay for it to be another tick on a UN General Assembly speech. These are all threats to our stability, to the people's stability in our lands. But you know, since last we met, there are other instances and circumstances, not of our making, that may yet destabilize us. And we say it over and over, but we ask who is listening. And you know, we don't come with tales of war only. The Caribbean has produced excellence. It really has. Nobel laureates. Sportsmen who have excelled and are the best in the world of their type. Artists, the best in the world of their type. Leaders who have inspired previous generations and current generations. We don't come here as a proud people asking for handouts. We don't want and will not be mendicant. What we want, no, what we need is fiscal and policy space fiscal and policy space to achieve sustainable development, to be nimble, to adapt, and to innovate in ways that allow us to be true and faithful to the task of bringing prosperity to our people, or as in the theme of this General Assembly, to eradicate poverty, to educate our people, to include all such that there's not some outside and some inside. We want an international order equally that recognizes that there must be different policy prescriptions to suit the circumstances that we all have. And we can still be friends, small and large, north and south, Christian, Hindu, Muslim, all different races, all genders. An equitable and just international order that is truly built on the principles of justice and fairness for all and not just for some. A United Nations that recognizes that as 74 years old, we must be able to have difficult conversations as mature people and solve them. Many in the developing world were persuaded or required to abandon policies that were designed for the majority of our population to be transformed. And those policies were fashioned to adopt a consensus that was settled in Washington, D.C. and named thereafter. And that ultimately, regrettably, was about the consolidation of wealth in the hands of a very few. That's why we have seen the growing inequality that we have seen in the world over the last few decades. That is why too many people over the world have become cynical about governments and about the benefits that they can bring to them. 
The fueling of the greed of a few threatens to undermine what little gains we have made since independence. And we judge ourselves harshly because independence is a recent phenomenon for us. Others who have taken 150 years to get where they have gotten are still stumbling and falling. And you want to judge those who have had less than 50 or 60 years to operate in a world that has not been made in their image and that does not reflect their interests. This is the fate, my friends, of simply too many. And Mr. President, despite our small sizes, the 14 countries of the Caribbean community have been able to play leadership roles of international import. I can't stand here today without talking about St. Vincent and the Grenadines. That has become the smallest nation of the world ever to be elected to the Security Council to sit on it. We are proud of them. In addition, and I want to speak to this, because when CARICOM was confronted with the unfolding situation in Venezuela, I accompanied the then chairman of CARICOM, the Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis, as well as the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, to meet in this building with the UN Secretary General in January of this year. And we met with many delegations. And some said we were wasting our time. And some said the time for talk was already over. And we said then, as we say almost nine months later, the time for dialogue, the time for talk, my friends, can never be over in a world that wants peace and prosperity. <laughs> we don't take sides, but what we know is that you cannot propel war over dialogue. The people of Venezuela must be allowed to decide their own future in accordance with the principles of the United Nations Charter, principles of non-intervention, non-interference, prohibition of the threat or use of force, respect for the rule of law, human rights, and democracy. It is regrettable that other multilateral organizations have not followed their own charters. And that is what makes the actions of our Secretary General of the UN more laudable for refusing to breach his own charter and take actions even though member states have hurled into the recognition of those unelected. Our Caribbean Sea must remain a zone of peace and for that we shall fight. Mr. President, I speak plainly and without fear because from independence, Barbados's foreign policy has been premised on the simple principle of friends of all, satellites of none. Barbados, therefore, has always remained and will remain proud to have Cuba as a treasured friend. Barbados established relationships with the People's Republic of China when others failed to. We may be small, but we are principled. Our relationship is based with Cuba on a historical foundation rooted in solidarity, cooperation, and complementarity of a common Caribbean civilization. And we say that the long-standing economic embargo on Cuba continues to be a cause of serious concern. I reaffirm Barbados' strong opposition to this unilateral action, and more so, the recent activation of Article 3 of the Helms-Burton Law imposes new restrictions and further exacerbates the situation. And I ask you here, to what end? To what end? The continued attempt to stop the people of Cuba from living with basic human dignity is unacceptable. Mr. President, it is time that the global community recognizes that small island developing states are truly equal partners in the international arena. 
and that our special development needs must be taken into account in the multilateral forum. Growth in the economies of the developed states, we contend, must not come at the existence of the very viability of small developing statements. Small children have a phrase for it. They call that cowardice. They call that bullying. They call that crowding out. We ask for fairness, equity, and opportunity to take our legitimate place in the global community. That is all. That was the promise of our membership of this organization. And I know that today I have a duty to acknowledge and commend the heroic efforts of our Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who is swimming against the rising tide of anti-multilateralism and anti-globalism, navigating the dangerous currents of dwindling resources and resisting, my friends, the efforts to set adrift all of the excellent work done over the last seven and a half decades by leaders across the world and his predecessors to ensure development, peace, and the dignity of human family. As a small nation, we are not only committed to multilateralism, we also understand that it is the one thing, the one thing that protects our sovereignty and our ability to navigate in this world. It is our buffer against the display of might, and it is our shield against tyranny. We continue to view the United Nations as an important mechanism for achieving international peace and security and sustainable development for all countries, but in particular, in particular for the most vulnerable.